We've got Berkeley Dietvorst on the podcast. Berkeley is a professor at the Chicago Booth School of Business. He also has a PhD from Wharton in decision-making processes. So he's a, he's a real businessman, I would say. And uh, Berkeley's research actually focuses on algorithm aversion. So essentially, the mistrust that human beings place in algorithms when they see them making decisions in different contexts, which is very interesting because you know most of us have some understanding that we're living in an era of Facebook and Google Maps and predictive search results and, you know, Amazon recommending all kinds of new things for you to buy. Um, all these things are all based on algorithms and they're a huge part of our lives. But the reality is, is that most human beings don't really trust algorithms all that much and potentially make a bunch of errors because they prefer their own decision-making process to an algorithmic decision-making process. So Berkeley has set out to figure out why that is what's the deal and what we can do to potentially improve uh, decision making across the board by allowing humans to focus more on trusting the algorithm in certain contexts. So he's done a bunch of different studies on that. We kind of dig into the details there. Um, we also just have a general discussion on cognitive bias and all that kind of stuff, which I've always found very fascinating, just the, the intricacies of how our minds work and how we deceive ourselves. So Berkeley has some great insight there. So I think you guys will like this one. Check it out. So Berkeley, you study decision making and algorithms and algorithm aversion, yet you are a marketing professor, which at first glance seems to be slightly confusing and potentially at odds. Please explain this confusion to me. All right, sure. I, I, there's a number of good answers for that. Um, one of them, I was actually coming from a business school. So I had my undergraduate degree and my PhD from Wharton, which is a business school. And it's very hard to move probably, I think, from business school to psych department, where, which would be the other natural place to study this kind of stuff. Um, so within business, I think that the domains where there's really these decisions about whether or not to use an algorithm to make decisions is in marketing, right? So we think about managers and businesses deciding whether or not to use an algorithm. A lot of those are in marketing, like how to price your product, how much quantity to produce, um, which ads should you run in what markets, all of those decisions can be made algorithmically, who to hire. Um, and on the consumer side, a lot of the decisions that people make every day are consumer decisions. Which product should I buy? How much should I buy? Which show should I watch? How do I get directions from one place to another? And those are all decisions you can make with an algorithm but they're also marketing decisions. Yeah, and within marketing, there's all kinds of spooky stuff of, you know, Target sending people mailers for uh, pregnancy products yeah. without the people <laughs> themselves even realizing that they are in fact pregnant, that Target was able to infer that they were in the process of trying to become pregnant and were like, yeah, man, here we go. We'll send you all this stuff. And they're like, wait, what's happening here? Yeah, so there's some super creepy stuff like that. And now there's so much data about consumers that just to process all of it, you're probably going to need to use an algorithm a lot of the time, right? If we have human beings trying to look at all the information that Google or Facebook has about us, we probably couldn't even process it. So if you're trying to do those kind of tasks, um, using an algorithm these days is kind of inevitable because it's, it's just impossible for a human to do. But I think what's really interesting are these decisions where it's still feasible to use either a human or an algorithm um, how do people decide which one to use? Why might they use a human in cases when an algorithm would perform better? And how can we convince people to use an algorithm? Yeah, sure. So the, the term big data uh, is kind of thrown around a lot. And people have some sort of intuition, like you said, that you know Google and Facebook and Amazon have creepy amounts of information about all of us and are listening in on our conversations and recommending products based upon that, which um, you know is almost certainly not true. But it's the truth is creepier than that yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of the amount of information that they, they do have about us. But um, you know, it, it seems like the, the, there's this understanding that all of this algorithmic decision making is going on, yet, um, as you've shown in some research, humans do not really like using algorithms. Mm -hmm. Why? What's their problem? I think there's a number of different reasons. So it's definitely something that's multiply determined, um, but we can go through a, a few of them. Some of my research would suggest that for any decision that people think has moral content, so something that I would consider to be a moral decision, I just don't want an algorithm to make that type of decision. Right? So we could think of moral decisions maybe as those that affect other people's well-being. 
And it seems like it's actually hard to learn and get deeper about this, but people just feel that an algorithm should not make decisions that really have a strong, profound effect on other people's well-being. Yeah. So the types of domains can drive people's preferences for algorithms. Also, it seems like people react differently when algorithms make a mistake versus when humans make a mistake. So when an algorithm makes a forecast and it turns out that forecast is off, it's not quite correct, um, people kind of seem to act more like the algorithm's broken and imperfect and we shouldn't use it anymore. Where on the other hand, if a human makes a forecast and it isn't perfect or it's off, people seem to think more, well, the human can try to do that differently next time and learn from it. So we shouldn't necessarily avoid the human just because they made this mistake in the past because they can always do something different. But people see the algorithm make a similar mistake and say, that tells me that the algorithm's not going to be perfect in the future and I just might not want to use it at all. Yeah, so a lot of your research is actually focused on that phenomenon of people sort of punishing algorithms for making mistakes. Um, you know, I, I recall reading some of the studies that you did focused on uh, forecasting performance in graduate school, uh, as well as, I, I don't remember the exact context, but something about predicting uh, airport traffic or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Can, you, can you give a brief summary of what those actual studies look like to make that point a bit more, I guess, salient for folks? Yeah, so I've done a number of studies. Um, our first paper on this topic our main finding was almost exactly what I said. People are significantly less likely to use an algorithm once they've seen it make mistakes relative to a human. That doesn't seem to happen so much. So when a human makes mistakes, people still are willing to use the human. So um, in all of those studies, those are the two domains we used. You're either predicting how a graduate student is going to perform in their program or predicting how much air traffic comes from the different states in the United States. And what participants would do is they would first go through a practice round where they just gain familiarity with the task. And in that practice round, we put people of one of four conditions. So they would either make their own forecasts or see another person's forecasts and get feedback on how that human performs. They'd see a model perform and get feedback on how that model performs. Or they'd do both, see a human perform and a model perform and get feedback on both or they'd skip it completely and just move on to the next section of the survey without any practice. Then after that, they would um, make a decision, and that is, do you wanna use the human's forecasts you saw or the model's forecasts you saw to make a set of incentivized forecasts? And what we found is that those participants who saw the model perform, so either saw the model perform on its own or alongside a human, were significantly less likely to use it and those who hadn't seen the model perform were significantly more likely to use it. And what makes this really interesting is that those participants who saw the model perform saw it perform significantly better than a human would. Right? So in this condition where they saw the model perform and the human perform, the vast majority of participants saw the model beat the human pretty badly but they still didn't want to use it after learning it's imperfect. Yeah, and, and just to clarify in terms of what people are seeing here, uh, they were they were given uh, some set of data on these theoretical graduate students, right? It was something They're like, real. That's okay, all real. real. Yeah, real students. So so something like a GRE score, undergraduate GPA, what else were they given? Oh, gosh. You asked me to remember all these things yeah. a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. So it was um, test scores, respect to fellow students, how prestigious your job was, um, promotions and raises after graduation. I'm probably forgetting one or two things, but it yeah, was sure. that kind of stuff. But they were given something like five different variables on which to sort of project forward what this person's success was going to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so they would, they would see that stimuli that described a student. Um, then on the next page, they would see whatever, for, either the forecast that they made or the forecast that the model made and the actual answer of how well that student performed so they could judge the accuracy of whichever forecaster they're exposed to. Sure, and then they would then, based upon the experiment, some people would actually see uh, an algorithmic model, which was essentially a linear model, correct? Yeah, they're all linear models in this paper. Yeah, so it was basically just uh, giving some sort of weighting to each of those variables, GRE score, undergraduate GPA, whatever, and just creating a, a, an equation that sort of linearizes that into to one factor that then sort of predicts what's going to happen to that person, right? So it just essentially weights each of those separate uh, variables a certain amount based upon, I don't know how the algorithm was actually created, but it, it's a relatively straightforward yeah. process. You just do a little bit of math and say, okay, this person, you know, gets a whatever, a 0.85 
And so they're going to do better than someone who has a 0.7 when you just kind of condense everything into one piece. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. It's just like a very simple multiplication and addition problem yeah. where it'll multiply some number um, that's the weight you're giving that attribute by that person's value, add all of those up, and then that's the score for that person. And the higher your score, the better of a student we think you're going to be. Sure. And even though that model's so simple, it really outperforms humans yeah. by a lot. It's, it's actually really not hard to be a significantly better forecaster than a human. <laughs> people are not very good at that type of thing, which is pretty funny. And so people would see um, the projections of the model and projections of humans, which were way worse than the projections of, projections of the model, and then they would still decide to weight their own financial reward from making appropriate projections predictions to the human's predictions instead of the model's predictions, which on paper are just obviously better. Yep. And then even when we, <laughs> except for those participants who hadn't seen the model perform. So those participants who hadn't seen the model make any forecasts, the vast majority of them actually use the model. And so they perform better and earn more money. Interesting. So in the abstract, people are like, yeah, for sure. I know statistics is a thing. Seems like a good idea. I might make some more money if I use statistics. Sign me up. And then they, yeah. but if they actually see it perform, they're like, yo, this thing makes mistakes. I hate it. I quit. Give me a human instead. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, the really interesting thing is even when we look at, we collected at the end participants' perceptions of how well did you perform and how well did the model perform. Even when we only look at those participants who said the model is significantly better than me, they're still less likely to use it if they happen to be in one of those conditions that saw it perform. Yeah. Um, and so you, your, your hypothesis is that when the model makes an error that people get frustrated and, and think that the model is not effective, right? That, they, that, that their abstract conception of the model is something that's near perfect. And then when it's not perfect, they're like, actually, this thing is not what I thought it was. I don't want it. And or they think that humans are going to be able to learn from their mistakes and then become better at forecasting than the model over time. Is it one of those, both of those, some combination thereof? Uh, we didn't specify in that paper, and that's what we were thinking at the time. But actually, I have a paper I'm trying to write right now that's exactly on this. Why are people doing this? Um, so pretty much our thinking now, based on a number of studies that we just completed, is that people are kind of risk-seeking. So once you've seen a model make a bunch of mistakes, you know that it's imperfect. And even if you recognize it's better than you, using that model would be accepting some imperfection for sure. Where people recognize that the human's worse on average, but they have this kind of magical thinking where they think, yeah, the human's worse on average, but it could be perfect. And so they'll choose the human, recognizing that the human's worse on average, because the human could be perfect, and the algorithm for sure is not. Now, none of this is correct. The algorithm is more likely to be perfect. The algorithm performs better on average. No matter what, you're better off picking the model. But people seem to have this idea, this magical thinking that the human could potentially be a perfect option. Yeah, and in a lot of different areas, there's that tendency for people to take risk for some small potential of a large upside. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of saying that it's not even an appropriate risk to take in this case because the model as a whole has a better chance of being perfect because I mean, especially in these conditions where it's not something super like complicated or um, messy as far as the math of it, like it just a, a better prediction is a better prediction. The better prediction has a, has more chance of being perfect essentially yeah. than, than a worse prediction. Um, but that, I mean, we see this, what in investing, we see this in sports, we see it in CrossFit all the time where someone thinks like, Oh man, you know, if I just get these workouts and like, I have a good day and I take my pre-workout, you know, then I'll be able to beat this person. Who's a, you know, a multi-time regionals athlete. Who's way better than me. It's like, no, no chance. No, yeah. It's not going to happen. But it, it is the same kind of magical thinking, right? Where like, if I just go on the predictions based on the model, it's going to tell me what's right most of the time. Not all the time, but what's right most of the time is the best prediction. You can't do better than that. Um, and I think a lot of this comes down to how people think about randomness and irreducible uncertainty in the real world. How do they think about it? So, I mean, the short answer is a lot of lay people don't think about it, and that's kind of the problem. Um, but I think people really vary in the extent to which they recognize that irreducible uncertainty 
affects all the outcomes in our daily life. And can, and can you just clarify that term? I think that I, I have an idea of what you mean, but that I think that there's a <laughs> lot in that term uh, yeah. that would be potentially worthwhile to unpack. Yeah, absolutely. So irreducible uncertainty is uncertainty that we can't do anything to resolve until there's an outcome. So for example, rolling a die is irreducible uncertainty because until we see what side the die comes up on, we have no way of knowing what's going to happen. We could do anything we wanted to try to predict the outcome of this die roll, but until the roll happens, we won't know for sure. Where reducible uncertainty, on the other hand, is where you could know in advance what the answer was, right? So if I asked you what's the capital of some obscure country and you don't know, that's reducible uncertainty because you technically could know the answer, although you don't. Yeah, for Irreducible sure. uncertainty means you could not know the answer. Yeah, it's basically, it's baked into whatever system you're utilizing and you can't actually figure out what's going to happen until you perform the action that you're looking to perform. Yeah, exactly. And so in the real world, lay people, I believe, really underestimate the extent to which this type of irreducible uncertainty is determining all the outcomes around us all the time. Um, right, like you were just talking about predicting performance of CrossFit athletes. Someone might get hurt during the games next year and they're not going to win then. Uh, someone might just be having a bad day. Someone could misstep. Someone's chain could fall off their bike. Um, there's all this kind of irreducible random stuff that can affect outcomes and does affect outcomes all around us all the time. Um, but people tend to act as though things are pretty deterministic and you could predict most things ahead of time. Yeah, sure. Um, so something else that you mentioned that I, I wanted to circle back on was the, uh, the concept of decisions that have some sort of moral component to them, mm -hmm. right? That that's something where people also experience this hesitancy to use algorithms, which I think intuitively makes sense, right? You don't want some robotic, cold-hearted algorithm deciding whether or not, you know, someone lives or dies or whatever. And that's always a good way to sort of fan up uh, political controversy is to, you know, needle that type of, needle that type of concept. So, um, in the case of, for example, in your studies, you had the uh, air traffic prediction, you also had the graduate school prediction. And something I noticed, which um, it's always a little iffy to cross compare studies like this, but the it seemed like the percentage of people who use the algorithm was much higher in the air traffic piece than in the uh, um, graduate school piece. Is that potentially related to that concept of someone not wanting to make a decision affecting a human's life and success based upon an algorithm? Whereas they're like air traffic control, dude, I don't know. Trust the numbers. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure on those studies. So one difference between those is that they use completely different samples of participants. So some of those were run on undergraduates at the university I was at. The air traffic studies were run online with completely different people. So it's hard to say. What I'm really confident about is the way we frame those predictions about MBA students. We were just saying, predict how well the student is going to perform. If we change that to decide which student gets admitted to the program, I think then people would feel that's a very moral decision because we're allocating resources to people and they'd probably be much less open to using an algorithm for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, and I think that one of the things that's interesting about it is that um, people have this aversion to using algorithmic decision making, but by not using algorithmic decision making, they're, they're, they're still essentially relying on some sort of algorithm. It's just a worse one, right? Like we're, our own brains are very clearly using some sort of algorithm to decide things. And it's just not the same, uh, the, it doesn't have the same mathematical precision that we could create with some sort of external decision-making process. I think, I actually think it's a little bit different than that. So it seems like the way that people make forecasts, effectively what they do is they use a different algorithm for every single forecast. So I'll uh, see- I got it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see one student who I really like, who wrote a great essay and got great test scores. So for them, I'll give their essay and their test scores a lot of weight because that's a way to admit them. I'll see another student who maybe for some reason their essay doesn't strike me well. I don't like it so much. So I'm going to give their GPA a lot of weight because their GPA isn't so great and now they're not going to be admitted. Yeah. I'll see one student from a different region of the country and I'll pay a lot of attention to that. And so 
really most of the problem with the way that humans make decisions and why algorithms are better is because algorithms treat everyone exactly the same and always give each piece of information the same amount of weight. And humans are always changing the weights between every person and making every decision a completely new way. And then when you're making a bunch of decisions all in different ways, you can end up doing a lot of things that are pretty inconsistent with each other within that set of decisions. Yeah, so you see uh, humans as doing more post hoc ras rationalization where they get a gut feeling about something and then will just sort of form fit the data to whatever they want to decide. Yeah, absolutely. And it's there's other things beyond that that could happen as well. For example, let's imagine I'm going through a stack of undergrads or people who are applying to an undergraduate program. If I just read the best essay in the whole thing, the next one I look at is going to look pretty bad. If sure. I just read the worst essay in the whole pile, the next essay I read is going to look pretty good, no matter what it is. And so the order that I read these things in can affect me. Um, all this kind of stuff can affect my predictions, and it's stuff that wouldn't affect a model. Right, yeah, and, th and then uh, um, I'm sure you've seen some of the research on decision fatigue and stuff like that as well, where yeah. you know, depending on when you you know, you're making a decision in the context of other decisions, when you last ate, um, how much sleep you got, all that kind of stuff can also sort of weight on how much you're actually able to invest mental resources in trying to process something appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. So there's all kinds of research suggesting things like maybe people get less generous in their decisions um, the longer it's been since they've had a break or something. And then they have a break and have lunch and all of a sudden they're, they're much cheerier and make more optimistic forecasts. Yeah, it, um, and, it, and it seems like some of that research shows that when people are mentally fatigued, they'll go for the default low risk option for them. Yeah, right. That they're basically trying to say, okay, I can tell that I don't have enough resources to really consider this to the full extent that I quote unquote should. So I'm just going to go for the lowest risk option, whether that's um, positive or negative. In this case, uh, I think the most famous study has to do with parole judges that mm -hmm. um, basically just said no to everyone <laughs> leading into their lunch break. Then after their lunch break, they're much more likely to say yes, because they'd sort of recharge and replenish or more willing to consider a case and offer uh, um, someone parole. Whereas otherwise, when they're fatigued, they're just going to say no, because they didn't want to be on the hook for potential Potentially letting someone out who uh, then went on to reoffend. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's probably the most famous one. Now there is some controversy about that paper. Yeah, now, of course. But um, certainly, I completely buy 100% that people are not making consistent decisions throughout the day, and that how tired you are or the last case you saw, it would not surprise me at all if that had a huge effect on the way that humans make decisions. Yeah. Um, with these studies on algorithm aversion, I'm curious to know what actually happens with people who may have, I guess, more statistical literacy than just kind of an average person, right? If you're just recruiting random people from the internet or um, undergraduates who may not have a good understanding of statistical modeling, is there any difference in terms of how people who do have some education in statistics or algorithm creation in terms of how they actually make these kinds of decisions? That's a good question. I think it could happen. We don't have any evidence for that so far. Um, in general, people who make worse forecasts use the algorithm a little bit more often in our studies. Oh, interesting. Um, which makes sense. Because you can imagine there's a first order and a second order thing where on the face of it, if you see your performance being way, way worse than the algorithms versus just little, mm. less worse, um, you can imagine that the more extreme your performance is relative to the algorithm, the less likely you are to use it. That's probably kind of the first order thing. Second order, I think, would be, do you have some understanding of statistics and does making, do you understand what an algorithm is? Do you endorse making decisions that way? Um, and I could imagine that those are also the people who might be better themselves at forecasting, but I think that's probably just a smaller relationship than the relationship between if I made a whole bunch of really giant errors, I might recognize on some level, maybe I shouldn't use my own judgment. Okay, yeah, so, so you're sort of seeing people who are just like, yo, I suck at this, like, yeah. I'll take the algorithm. Yeah, because my, my first intuition would be that people who are better at forecasting would actually be more likely to use the algorithm, kind of mm -hmm. based upon what you're saying, because they're probably better at forecasting because they have some sort of understanding of how to model stuff. So yeah. they're making less 
I guess, impulsive and arbitrary decisions because they are trying to weight these things consistently. And then that person might be more likely than to just say, oh, someone already did the math on this and kind of has an idea of how it should be done. Great. I trust that. Yeah. I'm also not sure how, how much that would happen, though. So there are a lot of good anecdotes about even statisticians or people who should know better who build some model to make predictions and then don't want to use it and want to use their own judgment anyway. Um, well, tell one of those anecdotes. I don't know. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, yeah. So I think, I mean, there's definitely some of these with like tech companies, right? Sure. Where they recognize we should be using algorithms to make all these decisions. And then when it comes time to make a hiring decision, they end up making a gut call at the end of the day instead of completely relying on the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, that's something where I think that you brought that brought up the point earlier of, of sort of moralizing things, right? That a hiring decision is sort of a human decision. So it makes sense that someone might not like the idea of using the algorithm as much there. Yeah. I mean, it's also, everyone recognizes the algorithm isn't perfect, right? And part of using algorithms is endorsing the notion that we can't be perfect. So let's be as good as we can be. Um, but it's really tempting and really hard not to want to make perfect predictions. So at the end of the day, when you know this algorithm isn't perfect and you have a really strong intuition about how it could be wrong, it's hard to override that and say, I just need to trust the algorithm and not use my own judgment here. Sure. Um, so a question for you is, I guess, related to this ability for humans to, to modify algorithms as well. Um, I'll ask a question on what we were just talking about, then we can dig into some of that research as well. So um, my first thought on what might be something that would make people feel better is the ability to almost veto an algorithm, mm -hmm. right? To not necessarily um, rely on their own judgment, but let's say hiring or something like that, right? Where the algorithm gives someone high marks and then you as a human being experience something that you didn't like, mm -hmm. right? And you might trust the algorithm in general and make almost all hiring decisions by it, but then have the option essentially to veto it and just say, you know what, no, there's this thing I didn't like about this, whatever, we're not doing it. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, a concept like that? So rather than the human making the judgment, they're just sort of telling the algorithm no if they have some very specific reason to not do something. Yeah, I think people would be pretty open to that. And I have some research suggesting that. So it, it seems like people are much more willing to use algorithms even after they've had experience with them and know they're imperfect, um, so long as they can have the final call and have some of their own judgment make the decision. So I think if you gave people the power to overrule the algorithm and say, you know, we're hiring 30 people, you get to object to, to 10 of them and say, even though the algorithm rated this person highly, this, they're off the list. I think people might be pretty open to that. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense too in a less, I guess, um, moralizing sense. I think everyone has ha probably had this experience with, uh, with Google Maps or some sort of traffic app where you do what it tells you and then you're mad because it didn't work out right. I mean, this happened yeah. to me actually last weekend where I was coming home from a, uh, a seminar up north and it recommended that I go a way that was different than the way I would normally go and I didn't want to go that way. Um, but it, you know, the traffic said it would be whatever, seven minutes faster. And actually, almost based upon some of these discussions we had, I was like, ah, I mean, fine, I'll trust the algorithm. Even though I, know, I probably normally would have been like, no, I'm not doing that. And then, um, and then I went this separate way, and by the time I got to the, the other interstate that I had to get on, you know, Saturday evening traffic had picked up, and it literally just took me an extra hour to get home. Yeah. Right? So the algorithm was trying to save me seven minutes, and it cost me an hour. And you I don't was, know, though. You don't know what would have happened if you would have gone the other route. Um, it... It would have been way faster, <laughs> 90, 98 percent sure. Okay, right, because it would have taken me whatever an hour and five minutes to get home, just going straight down ninety ninety four, and then two ninety four to two ninety took me two hours. Yeah, and I was. So you think if we would have, let's imagine we could rewind, rewind yeah. time, yeah, and redo this over and over again. Yeah, you think the algorithm was just straight up wrong, or do you think it got unlucky? Um. Well, I, I, what I think happened, and, and I'm not sure if this is uh, how this is baked into like Google's calculus, but essentially the there's like a Saturday evening rush or mm -hmm. whatever that starts right at that intersection of 294 and 290, right? Mm -hmm. And for people not in Chicago, sorry, um, you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll just have to trust me, right? And essentially I caught that rush and the algorithm either 
predicted that would start later um, or doesn't have that mapped properly in terms of when that actually happens. I mean, they, they have that information. I don't, right. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Yeah, but yeah, neither yeah. am I, right? But I mean, that, that's basically what happened. And like me as a human, I was like, ah, oh, that's not a good idea. Like it gets super fucked up there. I don't want to do it. Yeah. But I was like, okay, I'll just trust it. Um, and then I was mad. Right. Like I was more mad than I probably should have been where I was like, God fucking damn it. I knew better. I shouldn't have done that. Right. So like it, it is very sort of, I guess, salient when you do have that experience of feeling like an algorithm let you down. Yeah. Like it feels really bad. Oh yeah. Now see, I'm on the other side of it because I've done all this research. So every time I'm in a lift or in an Uber and the person goes away from the algorithm. And oh yeah. That's super frustrating the opposite too. Of what the algorithm yeah, yeah, yeah. says. Yeah. Every single time it seems like it's a bad decision yes, and definitely. I regret it. Yeah. Also, <laughs> also true. Also true. So, and when personally, I always use the algorithm like Google maps or whatever. Right. Um, probably there's been a handful of times where it got me somewhere slower. I really strongly believe more times than not, it made the right choice. Yeah, of course. And if I could perfectly pick, um, when it was making a mistake and when it wasn't, I would try to do that. But I think part of this whole thing is that you really can't. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I think it's one of those things where on balance, you're going to come out way better using the algorithm than not. Yeah. Right. And even though you will have those one or two experiences where you're like, yo, that that was not right, that those frustrating experiences can sort of push people away from doing something that on balance is a much better decision. Yeah. And then the problem is when you give people the opportunity to overrule the algorithm like you did taking a different route, people really do that too often. And there's going to be a number of instances where you do choose to overrule the algorithm where you would have been better off yeah. sticking with it. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what if you had some sort of, I guess, secondary decision-making process where if you're going to overrule the algorithm, you yourself have to be over 90% confident that it's the right decision, right? I mean, that, that's difficult <laughs> for humans to think that way, Yeah. but something like that might be, um, I guess, a reasonable way for someone to, uh, I guess, experience something like algorithm aversion without just being totally foolish. I mean, what are your thoughts on something like that? Yeah, I think that could work really well. Um, another thing we suggest would be, let's say a manager's ordering a lot of products for a store they manage. Say, every month you have five times you can overrule what the algorithm says, but you only have five, Yeah. you cannot have six. So be really careful because when you use one of your opportunities, that's a limited resource. So you better be really sure when you do this in make sure that it's really what you want to do. Yeah, so that sort of forces that same concept of like, you should probably be 90% sure that it's the right call to not do what the numbers say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, because it, it is certainly possible. I mean, yeah, say some sort of reorder algorithm that the store manager might know something that the algorithm doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Right, like, hey, you know, we're some sort of retail store and it was just absolutely terrible weather for the last two weeks and we had no one come into the store. We don't need to restock. Yeah, so I think that's a very good solution in the short term. In the long term, I have a much better solution, which is make the manager's judgment an input into the algorithm. Yeah. So for everything, over time, we can have the manager make their own prediction about what's going to happen, and the algorithm will learn over time, is this manager useful or useless? So if what they're giving the algorithm has no predictive power, it can just give the manager zero weight. Yeah. If it turns out what the manager's putting in the algorithm is really useful, the algorithm will start to give it a lot of weight. And, and that's kind of the trick is that algorithms know how much weight something should get relative to everything else. Humans can be pretty good at saying, I have strong feelings about what should be important and what's predictive, but past that, it's very hard to know how much weight to give things. So for example, let's say, go back to college admissions. We know that higher GPAs are better we know that higher test scores are better, and we know the better essays are better. Now, how much weight should I give GPA relative to test score relative to essay? I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Should it be 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, or I mean 0.4, or yeah. what is it? I have no idea. Um, where an algorithm can actually base that on the data it has. Yeah, it can sort of go through all the numbers and kind of crunch them and say, okay, these are the factors that we're looking at, and then over this data set, if we weight these like this, this is the best match for what the actual outcomes were. Yeah, yeah, so it can say, not only do I have some evidence that GPA is important, but I think the best weight we should give it is 0.4. Yeah, so then essentially, um, this concept of having the manager's feedback or like a human feedback uh, weight 
is is really just using the same concept of having all this data and then looking back at, okay, how much did the human's input actually impact what was happening in a positive or a negative way and then weighting it up or down over time based upon that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if it turns out this person's really useful and they're a great forecaster, the algorithm over time is going to give them more and more weight. If they're useless, um, we're not going to give them much weight, but maybe they'll still feel OK about this because they're an input into the algorithm and they have some yeah. some say and, in the process. And, and do they have to know how much weight they get? I would not tell them. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might not like that. Um, so we, we started to touch on this a little bit, but you've also done some other research in terms of uh, getting people to utilize algorithms. And you did a study that effectively showed that when people have the opportunity to do some level of overriding of the algorithm, that that greatly increases their interest in using it rather than their own judgment. What's the story with that? Yeah, so that was a follow-up to that first paper I described. Um, the outlook on that paper was a little bit sad, where we had this algorithm outperforming people and they weren't using it. And so obviously a follow-up question we wanted to ask is, well, how do we get people to use algorithms that are better on average that are going to lead to better outcomes? Um, so one of the first ideas we had was, what if we give people a little bit, um, let people use their own judgment a little bit, then will they embrace using the algorithm to a large extent, but not completely? So in those studies, we had a number of different conditions. So one thing we did was just give people the algorithm's judgment and then say, you can use this as much or as little as you want. And it looks like they gave it about a 50% weight, even when there was no enforcement. So, Yeah, so, so let me just clarify that. They were, they were still the ones actually making the predictions, but they were just kind of looking at what the algorithm said. And sometimes they would use it and sometimes they wouldn't. Is that? Or no, it was even, it was even different from that. So they would see the information about whatever student or target they're making a prediction about. And they'd also see, here's what the algorithm thinks. And then they would just type in any number they want for their prediction. Got it. And what we found is that even though we in no way forced them to use the algorithm, just putting it in front of them, they base, they were about um, twice as close as they would have been to its forecast than if they hadn't have seen it. So they gave it about 50% weight. Got it. Interesting. Then in other conditions, we did things kind of like what we were talking about, where we had things like you can adjust 10 of the 20 forecasts, but once you've adjusted 10, you can't... Um, give any more input. Or for every forecast, you can adjust the algorithm, but you can only adjust it a little bit. So you could only adjust it by five or by two. And what we found across all these studies is that people are significantly more likely to use the algorithm when they can adjust it or when they can have some input. But what's interesting is they weren't very sensitive to how much input they had. So when they, had, when they could adjust the algorithm by 10 versus being able to adjust it by two, they used it at almost exactly the same rate even though they had much less power to use their own judgment when they could only adjust by two. Yeah, so it, it's really, it's, it's almost like a respect thing, where it's like, <laughs> it's like no, I mean, I, I'm the one. Like, yeah. I'm the one who's doing it. <laughs> yeah, I think part of it's that. Part of, yeah, you don't, you don't want to feel like you're useless and you're not doing anything. And part of it's also, I mean, like we talked about, you know the algorithm's imperfect. You know if you just go with its forecasts, you're going to be off. Maybe if I just tweak it a little bit, it'll be better. It'll be close to perfect, right? So maybe we don't have to let people adjust it by whole large amounts in order to get closer to perfect. Maybe even if we just let people tweak it a little bit, they feel like now I, I can get it closer to perfect and I'm happy with that. Yeah. So, th so you still feel like it's this concept of, of chasing perfection that people are after. I think that's probably important, but yeah. that might not be all of it. Yeah. And, but then also to clarify, when people are adjusting the algorithm in this case, which again, is this the graduate school prediction? Is this the same concept for this study? Uh, there's a couple different ones. So we did the air traffic one again. Okay. And then we had a larger data set of data on high school students, and you're predicting how well they're going to perform oh, yeah. on a national math test. Yeah, they have like PSAT scores and all that kind of it's stuff. It's very similar to the graduate yeah. student one, but with high school students. Yeah, yeah, got it. But when people are allowed to make this adjustment to the algorithmic prediction, that they utilize the algorithm more, but still perform worse than just the algorithm alone. In this one, we didn't find that because we used a really simple algorithm. Okay. So it turns out in some cases, actually, people made the algorithm slightly better. Um, I'm very confident that if I would have spent a long time building what I think was the best model, then people wouldn't have been 
making the model more accurate. But we were using a very simple linear model, and so people actually did have an opportunity to add a little bit to the model's performance. Got it. So, so in some cases, people were like, you know what, like this kid's killing it. He just had a rough day on his PSAT. Let's give him a little more. And that that was actually <laughs> making it more effective. Yeah. And the other thing is there could be like an interaction between variables. So like yeah, sure. it's giving their GPA one amount of weight and what, co- what region of the country they're from, a different amount of weight, et cetera. But it could be that there's an interaction where like I recognize this student's test scores weren't as good. But because I know this other thing about them, I should really think that their test scores would have been better if they had more opportunities. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So there could be something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Got it. Um, Because in in these cases, the variables aren't totally independent. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they could interact where like getting perfect test scores and living in a poor family in a certain region of the country could be very different from getting those same test scores coming from a rich family in the Northeast or something yeah, like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, always a bit of a thorny topic, but you can probably, you know, try to extrapolate out from that, you <laughs> yeah. know, some, some characteristics of the person, uh, more so based upon that. So, um, algorithmic aversion, are there ever good reasons for people to not like algorithms? Yeah, there's a lot of bad reasons, which we can talk about. And then a couple good ones. Um, so one of the bad reasons is something like the black swan or some kind of very rare event that a human could see coming but an algorithm would miss. Um, I think that those are extremely infrequent, and I'm not sure that humans can actually predict those effectively. Sure. So if I really had a lot of faith that this was happening all the time and humans were good at predicting it, um, then I'd say, sure, maybe that could happen. I don't think that's the case. So for example, imagine like a self-driving car and imagine we're in a situation where a human would notice that something really weird is going on up ahead on the road, but the car wouldn't notice. And so the human would slow down and avoid some accident that the car gets into. I don't think that's going to happen too often. If it did, it'd be very rare. Um, On the other hand, what's the car going to do that beats human performance? the car is not going to get a text from its friend and look down at the phone and then run into a pole or something. Yeah. Right. Where humans do that all the time. Yeah. (laughs) Sadly, (laughs) sadly. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, by, by definition, by definition, black swan events are rare, right? So, um, would, in your opinion, then it be worthwhile to attempt to bake in some sort of uh, I mean, I guess it de- really depends on the context of what we're talking about predicting, but some sort of robustness or resilience into algorithmic prediction that does facilitate, you know, the opportunity for having these rare outsized events, like a like a massive economic crash or something like that in terms of financial modeling. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of thing that I would do if I was interested in that, because I don't believe we're so good at predicting that, I wouldn't make predictions that way, but it can't hurt to try And so I'd have a separate algorithm kind of in a back room, maybe trying to do those things. And once it's been operating for years, go look at the data and see if it was effective. So if we can get some data saying, actually trying to detect this stuff did kind of work and it was helpful, then I would implement that in whatever model I was using to actually make decisions. If I go back into that back room and look at this algorithm that's been running, trying to do this stuff, and it hasn't worked, then I'd say, great, now I have some evidence that that's probably not so effective. Yeah, so you'd almost separate it out as a different algorithm altogether, and then if it is effective, you could potentially integrate that into whatever your primary decision-making algorithm is, just as almost a separately weighted yeah. piece. Kind of like with software, there's kind of the official release at the moment, and then the beta. Yeah, that makes sense. Right, so I still want my official software to be doing the thing I think is best, but you might as well have a beta running in the background telling you what it thinks, and if you gather evidence saying that's more effective, then you can integrate that into the, the non-beta. Yeah, got it. So black swan events, I mean, that, that's, a, uh, and just to give a definition on that for folks, the idea uh, from uh, Nassim Talab has to do with extremely rare outsized events that have massive consequences on the entire system. So, you know, something like uh, September 11th impacting financial markets or, you know, the outbreak of World War II or something like that that is just this massive paradigm shifting event that uh, can completely disrupt anyone's ability to predict what's actually going to happen next because there's a sudden moment where a bunch of stuff changes. Yeah. And if we could predict that stuff, it would obviously be really helpful. 
Um, I just don't have a lot of, convi- of um, faith that we could. Right, sure. So some other ideas. One, one thing I've seen a lot is, what if there's just not good data for the model or there's been a paradigm shift where we have all this old data, but now things are really different and we would expect the model to work differently now. Um, so I think that you can still actually use an algorithm in both those cases, and that's because you actually don't need much data to use an algorithm, or any data really. So Robin Dawes, uh, someone famous for actually starting a lot of this research, has a number of papers showing that if you actually just make a model that gives everything the same amount of weight without any data, that outperforms humans most of the time. So for example, let's say we're trying to predict once again, who's going to be a good student. If I didn't have any data on past students and how well they performed, what I might do is say, all right, I think the information I have that's predictive is uh, GPAs, GRE scores, or test scores, SAT scores, um, maybe how well their interview went, although I wouldn't give that much weight, um, what their essay looks like, all this information, and just say, all right, Let's take that information and I'll give it the same weight. Or maybe even I'll use my intuition and decide how much weight to give each piece of information and we'll just consistently use that model. Yeah. Right. So even though that isn't based on evidence, um, the main advantage that models have over humans is that they're consistent and they always make every decision the same way. So just by writing down some equation like that and using that, um, I'm going to outperform human judgment by a lot. Yeah, sure. So e- even in low data situations, it's easier to just try to model it somehow and utilize that. Yeah, even in not modeling, just write down an equation that says, all right, I think this is, gets an importance of 0.5. I think this other factor gets an importance of 0.3. This other one, I'll give a 0.7 weight. I'm going to add all that up. And the target with the highest score, I'm going to judge as the best one. Yeah, sure. Um, Another criticism that I've seen has to do with, uh, I mean, particularly in stuff like school admissions or uh, hiring, which we've talked about a little bit, has to do with um, racism or sexism coming out in algorithmic predictions. I mean, that would, that would be another criticism that someone would potentially have. Yeah, so I still think that we should use algorithms, even though a couple of these things have come out. Um, the reality is algorithms are not racist, right? Unless you've put something into the algorithm where you've told it to be racist, the algorithm does not want to be racist. Often the reason you see an algorithm making decisions that look like they're racist is because you've given it data where there is some relationship between race or gender or something else and the outcome that you're interested in. Now the good news is, and the reason I'm optimistic about this, is that people in machine learning and in statistics have actually come up with methods to build models that don't do this. So although you can make a model that does this, you can use other methods so this doesn't happen. And pretty much what you do, one way to solve this that's kind of overly simplistic, but I think is a good demonstration here, you could actually put race in the model or gender or something, um, have the model make a prediction. One thing it's going to tell you after it makes that prediction is how much race and gender affected the prediction, and then you can subtract that out. Got it. So it can say, I gave this person a four point boost because they're female instead of male. If you don't want it to pay attention to people's sex, then you subtract four from all the females. And now it's not paying attention to sex anymore. Yeah. So you effectively allow the algorithm to weight the variable of race or gender, right? Based upon its calculation. And then you can say, okay, well, this is what it's weighting it. So then we can just do a little bit of reverse math and just pull out that weighting. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and that's and, and, well, but even that's uncomfortable for for people. They don't even want to see the the waiting in the first place. But that's counterintuitive. So what yeah. people think you should do is say, well, is let's, ignore it altogether. Let's but, not yeah. put race yeah. or gender in the model. Now the issue with that is that the model has a lot of other variables that are correlated with race and gender. Right. So for example, your zip code is very correlated with your race. So if we put people's zip codes in the model, but we don't put their race, what's going to end up happening is that the coefficient on zip code is actually going to be larger because it's going to be accounting for their race as well as their zip code to some extent. And so we put race in the model to make that so we actually know how much weight is being put on race and then we can subtract it out and get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And to someone who is 
logical and interested in creating an appropriate algorithm sounds like a great idea, but I'm sure that some, oh, no. some percentage of people are very unhappy with that concept. I'm, I'm positive there are many people I could not convince this is a good idea. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so what else? What's another reason that people do not like algorithms? Well, I think there's actually two really good reasons to be a little skeptical about yeah, algorithms. Sure. And I don't hear as much about these, but I think they're important. Um, the one that I think is the most important is algorithms do exactly what we tell them to do. And actually, we're probably not very good at telling algorithms what to do. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of kind of fun anecdotes, like think about the movie Aladdin, where you say, here's three wishes, wish for anything you want. And you see the person make their wish, and it doesn't turn out the way they would like it to. Right, so make me really rich, and it turns out that's not actually what they want. And we kind of have the same problem with algorithms, where if we said, all right, algorithm, here's a bunch of data on job candidates. I want you to hire the smartest person. It will hire the smartest person, but maybe that's not actually what we want. Yeah. Maybe we get that smartest person to come into the office and we say, wow, that person's really hard to deal with. Um, they're not gonna be good at interacting with customers. They're not working very hard. I'd, maybe I don't want the smartest person. Or kind of a sci-fi example that I like. It's, it's a little bit silly, but I think it's a pretty good demonstration. Imagine it's the future and we have really sophisticated AI and we put AI in charge of a hospital. And we tell it, you make decisions so that people live the longest possible. Which seems like, why not? That's a pretty good rule. We want people to live longer. That's what the algorithm can try to maximize. And then once that AI is in charge and it's doing anything it can to maximize that, it's doing stuff like putting people in a coma and tube feeding them yeah. because they'll live a month longer. Yeah, for sure. Just, or just, like yeah. doing an unnecessary surgery that's going to increase your life by two hours in expectation. Sure. Strapping them down and just putting them in the matrix and calorie restricting them. <laughs> yeah. And it, right, the algorithm is achieving the objective we told it to achieve. And it's going to do that better than a human could. But really, the objective we've given it is not what we want. Sure. And then, and then you also have um, kind of the flip side. Well, flip side is probably not the right word. But essentially, if there is an algorithm and people are aware that there's an algorithm making decisions, then they can essentially game the process um, based upon whatever the incentives are, right? And we yeah. see this all the time uh, in all kinds of areas. I mean, I've been a vocal critic of social media essentially for this exact reason, where most social media platforms have some sort of algorithm optimizing for various engagement metrics, which then drives up the amount of outrageous lowbrow content that just kind of pokes people's outrage sensors so they share it more and get fired up and comment a bunch. And it's like, okay, well, that's a fucking hellhole to, yep. to, to read through, right? Like I've just entered into uh, the absolute worst things that I could be spending my time reading, but this algorithm has optimized for this type of stuff being the major content that's shared. And then you have this, uh, this negative incentive based upon people understanding, oh, if, if I do this and I get engagement and my stuff gets shared. Yeah, but the algorithm is really doing what you did, exactly what you wanted to in the beginning. Right. It's analyzing what's happened in the past and it's come up with a prediction for what makes stuff really engaging. And it's probably right, but the consequence of using that in the long term is once people understand it, it's not just a one-shot game. Now people are going to try to game the system and you can get weird, annoying stuff like that. Yeah, or uh, what's, what's the example from the, uh, the New York City Police Department, right, that they had... Um the, a, a fellow went in and then came up with a with a process for actually tracking all the new the crimes in in different areas, right? And this was a total breakthrough and resulted in them being able to kind of map out where all the crimes were happening and sort of ahead of time get there and be able to stop crimes and and realize okay this is a problem area so we need to go in there and make changes and you know they would catch one guy who was just robbing someone literally every day and then the crime would go down dramatically and this was initially this incredible thing but then it sort of flipped where then the incentive came. Uh, became to reduce crime in your territory, which then resulted in massive underreporting of crime, right? The police officers would just be reclassifying stuff as misdemeanors that should be felonies because their incentive became, oh, well, my crime rate has to go down. Yeah. I mean, it's just, this kind of stuff can also happen with humans as well as algorithms. So I think, in my opinion, one good example is going back to undergraduate admissions, where once people kind of understand here's the kind of stuff they like to see on your CV in order to admit you to a really good school, it kind of escalates, 
where now to get into somewhere that like Harvard, a really hard school to get into, you need to volunteer at a ton of different places and have all these extracurricular activities. And that's probably maybe not because that's exactly what we value, but because at some point that's how you got in. And once people understood that, then they do that to try to get in. Right. Yeah. You, you end up with this weird red queen game of volunteering <laughs> where it's yeah. like you're just volunteering and volunteering because everyone else is volunteering. It's like, well, and everyone knows more. Yeah. Everyone knows in the past you had to volunteer for five hours. Yeah. So now you volunteer for six yeah. and then the next generation has got to volunteer for seven hours a week. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that stuff can get interesting. And certainly because algorithms are more consistent, maybe that can be even more of an exaggerated problem with algorithms. But I think this stuff also happens with humans. Oh, of course, yeah. Any Anytime people can start to figure out what the variables are that are going to result in a, in a decision being made, they're going to attempt to game the system. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the last one of these that I think is tricky to think through, so in a lot of these, you're not in direct competition with other people. So if I'm just trying to admit the best undergrads, the best thing I can do is make the, my, the best prediction possible about which undergrads are going to be good or bad. Now imagine you and I are competing in a game of chess. Um, if we're using the same algorithm, we none, neither one of us has an advantage over the other. We might actually want to deviate from the algorithm if yeah. we're directly competing with each other. Yeah, which like, you know, anyone who's played tic-tac-toe for any number of games very quickly realizes like, oh, this is how you win tic-tac-toe. And then it's yeah. just not fun anymore. Yeah, exactly. But now imagine we're like two companies competing with each other, or even worse, like 100 companies competing with each other. If we're all using the same exact algorithm doing the same exact thing, maybe I could imagine a case where it might be good to deviate from the algorithm just to try doing something that not everyone else is doing. Sure, well, I mean, and that, that's, that's essentially, you know, any, any sort of game theory modeling of like a complex system can sort of take that into account, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some, some of the, the classic examples of, of various iterations of like a tit for tat strategy, yeah. right? Where you just have, okay, um, I mean, it's probably, probably a little too much to go into the whole prisoner's dilemma <laughs> concept, <laughs> but essentially, right? I mean, if you have some people who will retaliate if they're screwed over, some people who are just nice to everyone, some people who screw everyone over all the time, and then you just have them play this game, um, forever essentially that there's a there's a natural settling point for that entire population where this mm -hmm. percentage of people are going to always screw everyone over this percentage of people are always going to um be nice until they get screwed over and then retaliate and then this percentage of people are just always going to be nice and, and no matter if they get screwed over or not and there's like a settling point that probably happens there as well right so i would imagine that in any sort of large-scale competitive environment there would be some sort of game theoretical settling point that would shake out based upon the different algorithms that people would potentially be using for these kinds of decision-making processes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also, if you have competitors who you know are following an algorithm exactly, you know exactly what your competitor is going to do. Um, so one cool example of this, in a lot of these prediction domains, all the research says algorithms beat people, algorithms are better than people. One domain where still an algorithm human team can outperform an algorithm alone would be something like chess where it is, is that out. still the case actually it was a couple years ago yeah. has it changed i actually don't know <laughs> i'm curious because i believe I, that is still the case yeah because I, I know my current knowledge yeah i know that's a thing that people say and i was like at some point i was like i wonder if that's still true i mean just based upon some of the advancements in ai i feel like i wouldn't be surprised if there's a tipping point where that's not true but anyway sorry go on that's that's true um i believe that's still true now you can imagine at some point there will no longer be true but as far as I know, as of right now, it's true. Um, actually, when you, when you take a game theory class, one thing you learn is that because of all the traits of chess, there's actually a, an equilibrium strategy. We just haven't been able to solve for it yet because there's so many possibilities. But eventually, with enough computing power, yeah, you, can, immense, you, can you can crunch you the numbers solve to the game find of it. chess. Yeah. Um, we don't have the computers to do that now, but you could imagine that could happen in the future. Yeah, that's cool. Is that the case with anything like chess that has sort of a finite number of moves, that there is some strategy? The conditions are different from that. So I'm trying to remember back to graduate game theory. Um, there's more conditions than that, but there's a certain, game, a certain set of conditions where any game that meets those conditions does have a strategy. A quote unquote call. solution. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying that human plus AI can still be only AI in chess. 
I believe so, or at least that was the case up to recently. Yeah. And so you can imagine there are some different, and I think what one of the things that makes that different from other environments is that you're directly competing with the other entity. Um, so if algorithms are really predictable in a competitive game, if you know what your component's going to do, you can often gain an advantage by being able to predict exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, and do you have any insight into what humans are doing in that context of chess that makes them uh, superior when paired with an algorithm compared to just an algorithm? No, I do not know enough about chess. Yeah, neither do I. I mean, <laughs> th that, that is some, I'm, I'm actually really curious about that though. Yeah. I mean, because I would imagine that, I mean, because the algorithm is just sort of brute force pattern matching, right? It's just kind of like, okay, we're going to calculate all these potential moves and all the processes that could happen, right? And it's just doing that through a tremendous amount of calculation, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm speculating. I really don't know. I don't, this. I'm not yeah. sure how these chess algorithms work. Yeah, um, right. But, and, but, but, but the human is pattern matching at a higher level, right? That, um, you know, grandmasters in chess and novices don't actually consider that many different moves. It's just the grandmaster can chunk stuff into these giant patterns that involve, you know, entire board space and yeah. seven moves into the into the future. So they're essentially running through the same number of, of calculations, but they're just doing it at a much higher level of abstraction. Yeah, another way I've heard it described is compared to a computer, humans, they, the grandmaster considers many less moves, just like a handful of moves, but they know which ones to consider. The computer just considers a whole bunch of different stuff and crunches the numbers. Um, but it seems like humans, just up to a point, know where to start and which things to look at. Yeah, sure, so the algorithm can sort of present like, hey, here's a few paths you can go down, and then the human, based upon that, can use the pattern recognition skills to say, okay, if we go down this path, here's what I think is gonna happen. If we go down this path, here's what I think is gonna happen. And that the human ability to pattern match there is potentially still better than an algorithm's ability to just brute force calculate what's going to happen. I mean, the other thing that could happen is, if the human or you could like trick, you could like trick yeah, the, the algorithm. If the human understands, yeah. if the human knows, the algorithm always does the thing that's best to do on average, and I know what that is, then I know exactly what it's going to do, yeah. and maybe I can outsmart it. Yeah, because you, you you could you could do some sort of false <laughs> false flag chess move. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, so I think that kind of thing could happen, but once again, I am not unfortunately a, a chess expert. Yeah, well, maybe I should maybe I should do another podcast with someone who knows all this stuff about algorithmic chess playing because that because that that example is thrown around a lot. And yeah. I'm always kind of like, well, what actually happens? Like, how does this work? What I mean, does the does the algorithm pop up ten moves and then the person decides which one to do? I mean, how, yeah, what? no, it's definitely like the person's looking at what the algorithm would do and the moves it's considering and choosing which one yeah. would be the best. Yeah, got it. So so I guess to to take that back more to. Um, maybe like a business strategy or another type of thing that using an algorithm may be negative simply in the context of this larger scale competitive environment where someone else may be using the same algorithm. So you may have to come up with some different thing to do because the, the benefits of being different outweigh the benefits of being, let's say, accurate. You can imagine scenarios like that. Now, right now, companies aren't using the exact same algorithm. Um, I still think you're probably going to be better off using an algorithm in most of the contexts I can imagine. But I could see getting to a point in the future where if everyone has the same data and they're using the same methods to make predictions, they're all gonna end up making the same predictions. And sure. operating a little differently could be an advantage. Well, and, and, and like we were talking about earlier, I mean, you can sort of set what you want the algorithm to incentivize, mm -hmm. right? So that the differentiation between companies may come down more to what you're actually optimizing for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. a great. Yeah, and everyone that's is a great thought. Yeah, everyone is going to use potentially similar similar algorithms to kind of run on their data set of okay, we're going to predict what people are going to click on or whatever. But it's like, yo, we want this. We want to we want to optimize for whatever engagement with long form think pieces, mm -hmm. right? Which I mean, you can imagine something like Medium dot com is probably doing, right? I have no idea what their <laughs> incentives are as far as how they measure stuff, but they're, yeah. you know, they're very clearly not operating in the same engagement. Uh, environment is something like Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, it's interesting. It'd be it'd be really fun to learn more about what these companies are doing. Unfortunately, a lot of them uh, keep it pretty secret. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th that's actually another good question for you. I mean, as as an academic researcher, um, you know, you're, you're doing this in a different context than people who are 
doing this to generate massive amounts of cash. Yeah. Right. And so there's a bunch of people working on these kinds of problems, but from different approaches. Um, I mean, what, what I guess is for you, like what, what is the thing that you want to do? What do you want to do next? What are you trying to, to research to figure out? I mean, most of my stuff, just reacting to the last thing you said, is really kind of focused on an individual decision maker trying to make the best decision they can in a pretty simple environment. So like when I go to the store and I'm purchasing something, what do I do? Or let's say I want to save for retirement, what do I do? Um, I'm driving from one point to another, what route do I take? Um, I think I still need to investigate all these kinds of decisions a lot further. So I'm still figuring out why is it that people don't like algorithms once they've seen the mirror? So I have a theory now about the algorithm seems kind of like imperfect for sure. And maybe I can choose the human who's riskier, but might be perfect. But there's, we still need to understand a lot more about that. Um, given what we find about that mechanism, that's gonna suggest new interventions that can get people to use algorithms more. Right, so if I understand exactly what it is people are thinking that makes them uh, behave that way, maybe you can address that with a new intervention that either convinces them that isn't the case or maybe even changes algorithms in a way where people no longer have the same criticism of the algorithm. Sure. So for you, kind of an ideal situation would be, I mean, you mentioned like retirement savings, right? Where that's something where any sort of investment thing, people are notoriously just wildly foolish. Yeah, right? they can be. Yeah. And that, and that, just relying on an algorithm would probably result in a huge number of people actually being able to save enough for some sort of effective retirement as opposed to just investing in some random thing or getting like, oh, Bitcoin, like, you yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think you can do pretty simple stuff, you know, just put your extra money in the market, put it in something like an index fund, especially if you have a, if you have a long time before you're going to retire, in expectation, if the future's like the past, that's going to work out for you. Yeah, sure. Um, you can try to get more clever than that, and that may work out, or it, that might be a bad decision. Yeah, and then um, I mean, if if you could, I guess, get on the inside of uh, of Google or Facebook or Amazon or one of these other massive web companies that's very clearly, you know, optimized a lot of their algorithms to some absurd degree. What would you be curious about as far as what they're doing? I think the thing I'd be most interested in is how do you tweak the way they present the algorithm to consumers to get them to use it more or less, right? So Google, for example, when we're using Google Maps, makes a lot of decisions about how to present that information to us. So they tell us, I think this is going to take 34 minutes, but almost certainly they actually have a confidence interval where they're saying, yeah. I think it's going to take between 30 and 40 minutes. Here's my probability for each one of these outcomes. Um, can you communicate that information to people in a way where they would understand it? And they might come to think that the algorithm's more accurate, right? So if I tell you my expectation is because it's going to take you 34 minutes to get home, that's probably going to be wrong by a little bit. But Google knows that. They're probably, I'm certainly that their algorithm says there's a 20% chance it'll take 32 minutes. There's a 20% chance it'll take 33 minutes there's another chance it'll take 34 right. minutes. Can we communicate that information to people? And if people understood the information that way, would they encode an imperfect prediction as an error? Or would they say that's actually in line with what Google was thinking? Yeah, for sure. Because I think that um, sort of like we talked about earlier, people potentially have an improper perception of how these algorithms function. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, it's like a, it's a fucking robot. Like it knows. Yeah. And then when it's wrong, it's like, dude, the robot is messed up. Right. Whereas if, if it is giving you um, some sort of error bar, which again, that's, that's a concept that's difficult for people. People, it's hard, yeah. people don't do well with error bars. I mean, think about any sort of election prediction. Yeah. Right? I mean, the, the classic one is of Trump. Yeah. Right. Where it's like, OK, there's a 70 percent chance that Hillary Clinton is going to win. And then Trump wins. It's like the predictions are false. Right? And it's like, yeah, well, no, but like they said there's a pretty good chance. chance is actually still pretty good. Yeah. Like, that's definitely not a thing that, you know, if there's a 30 percent chance of something happening like that's that's often. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, with my background and the way I think my takeaway was like, wow, Nate Silver is like a genius. Yeah. Um, but other people look and say, 
oh, he said Hillary was going to win, so how did he mess that up so badly? It's like, no, he said there's a 30% chance Trump's going to win. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess something like that is a little different in, in that it's a, it's, it's a winner-take-all type of situation, mm-hmm. right, where you, you're either right or wrong, whereas something like a, an arrival time, if you sort of have a buffer, then that's, okay, I, I, I have a window on it. But yeah. if you're talking to a human, they give you a window. Hey, how far away is this? I don't know, it's like half a mile. Yeah. Right? It's like half a mile, which you know, to most people is okay. If it is somewhere from 0.4 to 0.7 miles, I will not be mad. Yeah. And then there's actually more information that you can convey to people that'd be really useful. So if you're going to the airport and you're going to miss your flight, if you're late, you probably want to know when do I have to leave? So I'm 95% sure I'll be on time. Yeah. If you're going to your friend's house and if you're 15 minutes late, it's no big deal. You might say, all right, I'll leave when there's a 50% chance I'll be on time. Um, and so can we train people to, to use this information and then actually maybe make wiser decisions based on that? Yeah, that, that's actually really smart. I, I think that um, that's something I thought a little, about a little bit is why don't we have more options with a lot of these services that we use to kind of tweak how we get the information that we're receiving? Mm-hmm. I think it's because companies perceive, and it, rightfully so, that that'll just be confusing to people. People might pick options that don't make sense and be worse off than if we just pick the best thing for everyone. Um, But I'm hopeful we could get to a place where people could opt into more information in a smart way and be better off. Yeah, I mean, something like that that you could opt into, I would certainly opt in for that. Mm -hmm. Sign me up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and then I think um, you could have reminders from the program of their suggestion, there could be a default, but why not let people kind of expand their thinking on this stuff and see if they can learn more. Yeah, for sure. Um, All right, Berkeley, we've been going for a little over an hour talking about algorithms, um, which is great stuff. I love it. (laughs) So uh, you have some papers that I read that are very interesting. Um, If people want to learn more about your research and what's going on, what should they do? I think there's a couple good ways to do that. So if you just search my name, Berkeley J. Dietvorst, you can see my Chicago booth yeah, website, we'll, we'll, which is where we'll, Yeah, we'll link to that on the, uh, on the webpage and everything, too. So my research is listed there, and then I should be linked to copies of my articles on SSRN, which is just a database of articles, and then you could read those there if you're interested. Yeah, awesome. And then what's the, what's the next study you're doing again? Oh, there's a whole list. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, give us a few of them. Um, let's see. The next one's on algorithms. I'm still finishing up studies on do people avoid algorithms because they're kind of risk seeking and they're choosing the human because it's this um, risky option that could be a home run Yeah. where the algorithm feels like it's not going to be a home run. Um, With a really great grad student, I'm running studies now that are about people's preferences between different types of algorithms. That's actually starting to be really interesting. So um, just one one little example of the study here, you're predicting the outcome of a die roll. Well, it's, it's a seven-sided die, which aren't very common, but I had that just so the average could be four. Yeah, well, I played uh, Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, so I'm very familiar with all, right. all kinds of different sided die. So you can very much, you can imagine a seven-sided <laughs> I die. I can imagine it. I can imagine a 20-sided die as well. Perfect. So, okay, we have a seven-sided die. I'm going to roll it, and it's your job to predict what it'll land on. And you're paid based on how close you get. If you're perfect, you get a dollar, let's say. If you're off by one, you get 90 cents. If you're off by two, you get 80 cents, and so on. Um, And you're choosing between one of two algorithms to make this prediction for you. One algorithm always picks four. No matter what, it it always guesses four, which is the smartest thing to do. Because that's the average, the most you can be off by is three. um, And you're going to earn the most money on average by picking that. But kind of always picking four feels a little bit like you're admitting you're not going to be perfect. Yeah. The other algorithm, the way it works is it rolls its own seven-sided die and it guesses whatever that die comes up on. Interesting. Which in terms of expected value is strictly worse. It's going to earn you less money and the vast majority of people end up choosing that die when I actually give them incentives. Sure. Which is very strange. Yeah. Um, so people don't want the die that always guesses four, even though that earns you more money on average. People want the algorithm that rolls its own seven-sided die, which kind of feels like swinging for the fences, hoping you hit a home run, 
instead of picking the safe option. Right, yeah, and uh, I, I wonder if that has to do with either a lack of sophistication surrounding the understanding of just like the, the probability and the math of that. Because mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's not an intuitive concept for people and you probably have to have some sort of training to understand, oh, okay, if I do the calculation, here's what happens. Yeah. Um, or if it is, like you said, a, a sort of swing for the fences type of thing. And I think probably both yeah. play, play some role. I think some people aren't understanding the four is the best choice and other people think, well, it's a low event, I'm gonna get it right anyway. I might as, do, as might as well do the one that intuitively makes sense to me. Okay. And I think we're gonna do more research on this to see if it's true, but one thing that could be happening is people might like algorithms that go through a similar process as the thing they're predicting. So when I'm making predictions, I like my prediction machine to do the same thing that the thing I'm making predictions about does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're like, yeah, this is how it works. Yeah, so if I want to predict die rolls, my prediction machine's going to do die rolls, and that's how I make the predictions, which intuitively makes sense. Uh, mathematically, it makes less sense. But it, might, but it may <laughs> increase sort of adherence to actually using the, uh, the algorithm, yeah, which no, is sort of what you're after. The problem is that's a really bad algorithm. So we're going to have to try to do something in between and see if people will accept that. Well, what do you mean? So the algorithm of I'm going to roll a seven-sided die and just guess whatever number that die comes up on, that's not just not a good way to make that decision. Yeah. An expectation you're not going to earn as much money as you could. So sure, I think people would endorse an algorithm that makes the decision that way, but that's not the algorithm that they should be using, and they're leaving money on the table if they do. Yeah. So can we add a little bit of that randomness but not go all the way? Got it. So there's, like, there's a small chance we're going to roll the die, but most of the time it picks four. How yeah. would that work? Yeah, interesting, because people very clearly are not going to like just picking four all the time because that seems wrong to them. Or, I mean, yeah. even like cheating, that seems like unfair, kind <laughs> of, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, that's cheating, right? Yeah, but if you give it some chance that it's not going to pick four, is that enough to get people to be happier with that? Yeah, because it probably gives them more of a chance that, okay, there, there's a, a higher potential for some sort of outsized reward. Um, and it also doesn't feel like I'm not modeling the thing correctly or I'm like kind of gaming it. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Yeah, well, let's, let's find out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thanks for listening all the way through. I admire your grit, your persistence, and your perseverance. Since you made it, I have a few favors to ask of you. Go ahead, open up the show notes on whatever podcast player you use. In there, you'll find links to all the resources that were mentioned throughout the show. There's also some links there in which you can leave a review or subscribe to the show. And podcasters are always harping on this because this actually makes a difference in terms of the algorithms that recommend podcasts to new people. So if you do that, it helps more people find the show. And if you head over to toddneef.com, you can sign up to receive most of my thoughts and writing, which really only go out to the email list. A lot of it never makes it to the blog or the podcast. So if you like what I have to say and you want to see some of my recommendations and stuff that I've been checking out, go ahead and subscribe to that email newsletter as well.